This is the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria, session number nine. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey everyone, it's Matt Sikori here, coming at you with another session of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. In today's episode, we talk to Manny Rodriguez from ABA Technologies. Now, Manny is their Director of Continuing Ed and Product Development, and we talk all things OBM, what life is like as a practitioner, how to craft a sane work-life balance, the future of OBM. Uh, We go all over the map. Uh, I think you're really going to like this conversation. He gives us also some really good tips to apply some OBM principles in our everyday kind of quote-unquote normal behavior analytic practice. So uh, before getting to that, however, I do want to let you know that uh, this episode is sponsored by bside21.org. And in fact, that's where I learned about Manny and uh, through reading his blog entries there, I I thought he would be a good person to have on the show and and share his expertise. Uh, And as you know, the bside21.org is an ABA news site that discusses uh, kind of everyday events from a behavior analytic framework or lens. And in fact, if you go to bside21.org and type Manny, M-A-N-N-Y, in the search bar, uh, it'll pull up a bunch of articles that he's written. In uh, our discussion today, we close with, uh, he teases us with a book that he's got coming out called uh, AB, uh, excuse me, OBM Applied. And so if you type Manny in the search bar, you'll come up with an entry on bside21.org called Engaging the Doers. And that will f- uh, feature kind of an excerpt from the book that he has co-written along with uh, co-authors Dan Sundberg and Shannon Biaggi. So... Without any further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Manny Rodriguez from ABA Technologies. Hey, Manny Rodriguez, thank you for joining me today on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing? Good, Matt. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Well, this is a real exciting uh, conversation that I've been looking forward to for quite a while. What we try to do here on the podcast, obviously, is have a variety of topics. And we haven't had anyone on talking specifically about organizational behavioral management. Um, So... This is, a, like I said, a great opportunity to uh, inform our listeners of uh, this field that uh, we don't often think of when we talk about applied behavior analysis. So I want to get into a lot of those details, but first, as I like to ask all my guests, I, I want you to tell me the story about your first encounter with behavior analysis. How would you get into this field? What was it like at the time? You know, just kind of fill in the blanks there. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you again, Matt. And uh I'm, let me start by saying I'm truly honored to be your first OBM professional talking about OBM. Uh, it's an honor indeed with uh, so many great pioneers in the field. Uh, so I hope I do them justice as well as the field. So, but, uh, so how I, my first encounter with behavior analysis um, goes back to my undergraduate days at Florida State University. I was a dual major in psychology and criminal justice. Um, my, my pursuit of my career was actually going to be in criminal justice. So I had a couple of internships and practicum opportunities and as an undergraduate student uh, at the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So that was kind of the route I was going. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, it was, it was exciting and nervous and all that. Um, and I really don't, at, you know, in hindsight, I don't know why I was doing that, but it just sounded cool. And, it was uh, a good idea at the time. Yeah, it was. It was. It was the thing to do. Um, and uh, but I then I took a careers in psychology course. It was a one credit course uh, to get kind of an idea of what all the different careers were. And there was a professor that uh, showed up to talk about um, applied behavior analysis, specifically performance management, and uh, which is um, a, a bit of a subdiscipline under the broader context of organizational behavior management. And performance management was kind of a novel uh, thing for me. And the professor happened to be Dr. John Bailey. Okay. So Dr. John Bailey presented in this course, in this careers in psych. It was like a, like a seminar, if you will, like 60 minutes to spiel about uh, ABA. And, and there was something that clicked. And one of the things that clicked that he presented that I'll never forget 
was he was really focusing on the application in business. Now, at the time, just a little more backdrop on that. So I was a struggling undergraduate student. I, financially, I needed money. I had two jobs. I actually worked for the uh, Office of Telecommunications at Florida State. So the people that plug everybody's phones and internets and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I also worked at the local subway as a, as a subway artist, sandwich, sandwich artist. artist. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. very familiar with that. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Bailey used the several examples of the applications of behavior analysis in business. And two or three of his examples happened to be in the space of what I was doing in those two jobs, right? Restaurants and performance improvement and process improvement. So mm-hmm. something clicked. Um, and this was perfect timing for me because I was, like I said, looking looking into criminal justice, but I was second guessing my career move. So I got an opportunity to go back and meet with Dr. Bailey one-on-one. And he just opened the door and taught me and even gave me articles to read um, about organizational behavior management. And the other thing he gave me was he had created a four course sequence called the Performance Management Certificate. And the four course sequence, you do it over the course of the last two years of your undergraduate schoolwork. And and this was just timing perspective wise. This was right before my third year. And um, it's a four course sequence. The first course was intro to ABA, Mm -hmm. uh, taught by one of his uh, PhD students. Uh, Second course was uh, sensation uh, conditioning and learning, where we got to work in the rat labs and then also go out and train pigeons and uh, that kind of stuff. So a little bit of EAB in there. Nice. And then um, and then the third and fourth course was him instructing on performance management uh, slash OBM. But there was two things that really happened in that last two courses that really kind of helped me go into this field full on. The first was we had to, we had to actually go out into the real world and do an applied project as undergraduate students. So no kidding, like go do OBM, ABA in the workplace, and and he would hold you accountable to a series of milestones like collecting data, working with the managers, uh, implementing a solution, etc. Uh, so I did that, and, and I did uh, very well, and uh, and and he was very proud of me. And then the second thing that really helped me was he brought in guest speakers, and one of which was Dr. Aubrey Daniels. Oh who, man, cool. Yeah. So, and of course, Aubrey, uh, for those of your listeners that don't know, uh, Dr. Aubrey Daniels, one of the early pioneers in the field of OBM, of course, uh, one of the founders of OBM as a field of study, using that language uh, in the in the 70s and 80s. And then um, Aubrey was just so welcoming and so warming, and I got a chance to like see him in class, talk to him at lunch and dinners and that kind of stuff. So... That was my first encounter in behavior analysis and specifically OBM, um, and that's what launched my career. And that was all as an undergraduate? That was all as an undergraduate, yeah. yeah it must have been. And one of the things, cool things about this field is that you know, we do have a lot of opportunities to kind of uh, meet people at, you know, at, very, at the very high levels. Of, of, of where they are in their career and, and to interact with them, whether it's at a conference or at least some of these opportunities and things like that. And I'm, that's uh, that had to be pretty uh, overwhelming and, 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 and pretty cool at the same time as, uh, as, as a young uh, Florida State student. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And who knows, if I didn't have those experiences, I probably would have been a cop and I would have been, you know, uh, dealing with those kind of uh, scenarios and conditions and, and uh, I, I respect police officers and law enforcement very, very much because that was the route I was going to go. Mm-hmm. And But, of course, it's a very dangerous business and um, I think I, I thank goodness every day that I met Dr. Bailey and Aubrey and, and all that. So it, it is funny how just meeting one person or taking a chance uh, on a course or something like that can steer your direction we have a lot of students who listen to this podcast and uh, i think everyone in behavior analysis has their own kind of unique story about how they got into it which is why it's kind of a staple question in uh, my lineup but before we get too far down the road uh, i would like you to take a moment and and really just kind of define what it, i mean we throw around the terms a lot in our line of work uh and in the case of uh organizational behavior management uh, what is the current understand i'm sure it can be defined many ways in fact i took a 
an OBM course in the economics department uh, at the University of New Hampshire. It was terrible. It was just this warmed over social psych stuff. And uh, so from a behavioral perspective, what is organizational behavior management mean to you? Excellent. Uh, that's a great question. I think it's one of my favorite questions that you're asking me. So because I find that it's very interesting. Uh, I've been in the field now for quite a while um, and I love talking about it and I, I really enjoy when people ask me that question. So to answer your question, so in the most traditional sense, OBM is defined as a subdiscipline of ABA. So similar to how ABA is applied with animals, with children with developmental disabilities, uh, OBM is kind of a is underneath the the bigger umbrella of ABA, right? So that's how it's always been traditionally taught. You know, uh, OBM is a subdiscipline of ABA, kind of as a very simple way to look at it. The 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 interesting part, though, for me, is as ABA has evolved to be synonymous with uh, therapy in the field of developmental disabilities. Uh, a lot of people, I think, in the last few years has lost sight of ABA is broader than just uh, the application with DD. Right. As I was and, talking with uh, Todd Ward uh, a few sessions of the podcast ago, you know, it's ABA is more than a VB map and an analog functional analysis. Yeah, and, and I, I respect any individual, your listeners included, anybody that works with that population. Uh, I'll share with you a little later. I, I, I had that experience as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, but one of the things I've come to realize, so OBM is a lot broader as well. So some people have a perception that OBM is, is really focused on either like individual behavior similar to ABA uh, clinical therapy. And the truth of the matter is OBM practitioners are really focused on organizational systems, processes, more macro level contingencies of how behavior is influenced in the workplace. So in, in all, in the very essence of what OBM is, it's really more of a macro study of human behavior in the workplace. And we try to influence improvements uh, in the workplace by looking at the organization as a very complex system. So look at it from very simple things in terms of work processes, procedures, job descriptions, you know, the very, the very things that are supposed to initiate people to do a job. And then the more complicated side on the consequences side. So performance feedback, all the way to how people are compensated and then how people are, their succession planning in terms of how they grow in a company, if that even exists in the company. So those are very complex systems because it requires an understanding beyond just applied behavior analysis. One of the, probably the most things that I struggled with when I first started was I had to learn business acumen. I had to learn kind of the understanding of economics and business mm -hmm. and, and how does a business even get set up to run uh, from a management standpoint and then finally the human resource side of things, the laws, the policies and procedures that govern how people get employed and how they stay employed. So all of those things are supporting the OBM practitioner, meaning the way that I define OBM from a, from a practice standpoint is ABA is the foundation, but the, a, o, uh, but the OBM practitioner allows for a series of other disciplines to influence how they understand what's going on in the workplace to then leverage ABA to make a difference. So is it, is it I, I suppose there needs to be some kind of, uh, you know, multilingualism in terms of, you know, how, how do we talk to each other in a way that uh, you can convey behavioral concepts and they can convey... By they, I mean the client, who, whatever form that might take, whether it's an, an organization or you know someone you're doing some coaching with or what have you, uh, so they can communicate to you and using their language in a way that you understand and stuff like that. So I have, I have to imagine for someone coming out of a traditional BCBA type of preparation, there's seems to be quite a lot to learn. Yeah, there there is quite a lot to learn, but there's also a way to learn it in a at a macro level anyway, in a shaping approach. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'll, I'll share, you know, the first way that I learned how to communicate OBM is I created an, a different way to define it. The, the definition of OBM is somewhat academic. 
uh, if you look at it. And and when you say something like the subdiscipline of ABA, the next logical question is, what's, well, what's ABA? Yeah, right, right? Right. So I kind of changed it to be a little bit more friendly, I suppose. And I'll open up a disclaimer. This is not a definition that's endorsed by anybody. It's just Manny's made up definition. All right, let's hear it. But my definition of OBM has two parts. First part is, Organizational behavior management is the science of human behavior applied at work to make a positive difference in people's lives. OBM is applied by looking at three facets of the workplace, the systems, the processes, and behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I use those two lines to really just start the conversation. And typically what ends up happening is two things. The positive difference in people's lives, people will say, well, when you say people's lives, who are you talking about? And my answer is anybody that's affected by the company. So that's employees, that's leaders, that's shareholders, that's consumers, anybody. The second part is the systems and processes, that specific language with respect to OBM, uh, how OBM views companies, systems and processes. Uh, systems could be techno technological systems, for example, could be economic systems. Processes are those procedures and policies. So those two, those two words resonate with the business person because they speak in systems and processes. Mm -hmm. Whereas and, someone in my shoes would be like, well, what do you mean by that? And can right. you define that? And, right. Yeah, operationally define a system. What, yeah, right. and, and OBM has done that in the past too. And, uh, and then when we lock in the third word, behavior, that really intrigues some interest. Now, uh, Aubrey has shared in the past, you know, maybe 10 to 20, 30 years ago, the word behavior was taboo in the business world because it was seen too closely to like childhood behavior mm -hmm. uh, or misbehavior. So we used to use the word performance, so strategy, process, performance. But now in the 21st century, behavior has become almost, almost everyday language in, in the workplace. And you're more common to find like building habitual behavior, building habits in, in very... Um, general speak in the business world. So it, it lends itself very nicely. Very cool. It seems like you got in. So getting back to how you got into OBM, given the, the typical routes in which people become behavior analysts, it seems like you, you kind of got into it from the get go, uh, right from the start. And, and having uh, uh, considered that, what, what were some of the first, uh, OBM interventions that you did and you know what, what what did you learn from them all right so so I'll I'll answer that question by filling maybe some of the the pieces of how I how I became into OBM even further so because it ties all together um, so uh, when I left Florida State I had of course the hard reality do I go to get a job or do I go to grad school? And I was very fortunate. I met a, a lovely woman who uh, at Florida State. John Bailey used to call us the performance management love story, oh, and <laughs> and uh, we were we weren't even dating at the time. But I met her, and she was very intriguing and very bright. And um, and uh, she was going to grad school, and um, so she convinced me to you know apply, etc. So the quick ant the quick of that is uh, her and I went onward to graduate school. And because at the time, people told me it was very difficult to find a career at OBM, even much more difficult to find a job at OBM, because that's what I wanted to do. But I'm a bit stubborn, and I'm pretty goal-oriented, and so I figured I could do it. I just have to figure out how. So leaving Florida State, I went to Florida Tech. And Florida Institute of Technology at the time had no OBM program, but the woman in my life became my girlfriend. We went to grad school together. And Dr. Jose Martinez Diaz, the, the program chair at the time, uh, convinced us that we could create an OBM program at Florida Tech. So <laughs> first year in grad school, we got really busy. We interviewed a bunch of folks like Aubrey Daniels and John Bailey to help us create a curriculum. And by year two, we were... Um, very busy in OBM at Florida Tech for the first time in Florida Tech's history, so we created the OBM track. So you guys, as grad, first-year graduate students, were creating uh, uh, the, the curriculum and... Yeah, oh, wow. That's... We, we created the curriculum, 
and we were able to get um, the, the university to approve an open position for an OBM professor, and we hired Dr. David Wilder. Um, if you ever get a chance to interview Dr. David Wilder, fascinating guy, I totally recommend it. All right. So, um, so to answer your, your question about interventions, uh, it's a very interesting word because my, my field of study in OBM, we always talked about, well, I always talked about and learned to talk about OBM solutions, mm -hmm. which it could be just a semantics thing, solutions, interventions. But the solution side is more geared towards a business audience. So I was always talk, taught to think about what we do in terms of solutions to a performance problem. Interventions is kind of a unique twist in behavior analysis because it's, it's a little bit more academic and more scientific you know, if you think yeah, about it, the lab coat. It definitely has a, a, a clinical ring. And if you're mm -hmm. trying to offer services to someone uh, who's not used to that type of uh, setting, I could totally see how a solution to your problem sounds a lot better to, you know, an intervention for a particular uh, condition or, or exactly. disorder exactly. or behavioral pattern or fill in the blank. Now, what's um, so just to get to your question, too, I think it's also worth noting, I, I, I haven't mentioned this yet, but when I was at Florida Institute of Technology getting my master's degree, I was a clinical behavior analyst. So I actually got a job uh, working at an uh, agency uh, that had clients that were developmental disabilities. And the only DD population I worked with was ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder kids, young kids, 6, 8, 9, 10, et cetera. And then, but the other focus of our agency was uh, using behavior analysis with at-risk children. So from young kids to teenagers who were at risk of either uh, getting kicked out of school, going to prison, uh, those kind of uh, individuals. And then we had the anomaly of some other like outlier cases. So I had a couple of young girls that I was uh, doing applied behavior analysis with that were diagnosed with anorexia and bulimia. So all of this, by the way, is happening at the same two years of my master's degree while I want to pursue a profession in OBM. And of course, I did the typical ABA interventions based on cases, right? So uh, parent training, uh, looking at um, how, setting goals for the kids, getting them to have very uh, programmed instruction or personalized systems of instructions. That was really the, the basis of my, my work. And my first set of OBM interventions actually started in my work with developmental disabilities and these at-risk kids. How that went down was within my job as a behavior analyst, I actually started targeting working, doing my work in behavior analysis with parents, teachers, school administrators, and other paraprofessionals like speech language pathologists and others. So I found myself in my early stages of becoming a behavior analyst pre-BCBA. Mm -hmm. I was actually not working with the kids. I was working in the systems and the uh, adult uh, population that would influence the behavior of the child um, and I was doing that and it occurred to me very quickly I was doing OBM in a clinical environment meaning I was my client was the kid who has a behavior challenge that they need to improve upon but the way that I attacked it was looking at more of a systemic uh, situation sure. of who's going to influence that kid when I'm gone well, that's, that's what I oftentimes say to folks because the same thing happens. I do a lot of school consultation, and uh, certainly we work with kids to demonstrate, to assess, you know, to model, to do all those things. But I always tell people the important stuff is happens when I'm not here, and uh, I'm not here a lot. I, right. You know, I, I have the visitor sticker on my shirt, and I get to take it off. And, and you know, I use that same analogy, too. I used to do that, and I used to actually... Uh, track how many times I met a school and I would actually show the principal look I'm starting to fade out you see I'm not coming as often that means your teachers are doing what they need to do to make that kid have a better environment at school so I love that I love that analogy That's, sure. yeah. so, um, so in terms of interventions or solutions that I've uh, one of the other things that happened during grad school and then I'll leave grad school and kind of come into the last over decade of, of work the I had um, my girlfriend, my colleague, and, uh, and I secured an internship 
during grad school with Aubrey Daniels International. So kind of starting to get full circle uh, a little bit. And uh, it was at a nuclear power plant. It was one of their clients. And our so- the solution that we implemented was a series of direct work observations, performance feedback for what they called knowledge workers. These were engineers, people that worked on computers. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they didn't really have a host of procedures in terms of uh, step by step. They work more in terms of um, non-sequential procedures based on whatever's happening in, in the situation. So they had to kind of think through uh, logically where they were, what the situation was, and then how to get navigate through the procedure in the right order. But it was never the same situation twice. So they, the challenge that came to us was how do we provide direct observation and feedback to people that we really can't monitor what they do and how they do it. So that was my first uh, experience truly implementing an OBM solution, which was uh, the end result was really good. We effectively got the workers to define and uh, vocally describe um, what they were doing, how they were doing it, why they were doing it at the moment they were doing it. So the observer simply had to, uh, using a script based on a bunch of historical data, find where they were and then start navigating the observation from that point onwards. Okay. Um, and then the feedback became very easy. Did they skip a step or not skip a step? Let, let me ask you this. Uh, I'm kind of skipping around here uh, That's okay. a little bit, but um, I'm just trying to think of things that... No, well, I guess my question is this. How do you establish rapport with... Uh, you know, I, I would imagine, for example, the engineers in the plant weren't the ones that hired Robert Daniels to come work with them, right? right. And, and so there has to be some sort of rapport establishing practice uh otherwise you go in there and say oh i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you how to do it and uh (laughs) or you know i mean i'm probably not saying it too artfully but um what what i mean is you know how how do you because what i'm trying to do here is, is see if there are parallels to those of us in the world of education and developmental disabilities oftentimes we do have to be about coaching people and and getting people to do things and oftentimes things that are uncomfortable you know whether it's extinguishing a you know a a, a behavior that's difficult, uh, or if it's uh, following through with a particular intervention despite the fact that that might create some evocative uh, circumstances, et cetera. And oftentimes, as as consultants, we we don't have any direct control over that staff. We don't they don't report to us. We don't supervise them, and so on and so forth. So. In the case of either the nuclear power plant or you know some of the parents you worked with or any of those other settings, how do you how do you gain uh, trust uh, to use a kind of a soft word, if you will? But you know how do you how do you establish yourself in, in, in a way that you're not the kind of know it all or the egghead from outside that the, that that so-called management I'm using air quotes hired to you know in, you know fill in the you know fill, you know mm-hmm. increase the bottom line, et cetera. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. I bet every behavior analyst has experienced pushback and yeah. uh, non interest <laughs> from one source or another. I think there's a great parallel. I think there's an absolute parallel to any behavior analyst, no matter what their population. I bet I bet even the folks that work with animals get the occasional uh, animal that doesn't want anything to do with what they want. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, to answer your question. So there is a parallel. I bet um, I've had the experience, probably similar to other behavior analysts, working with a teacher or a parent that wanted nothing to do with what we do and how we do it. Uh, same thing with principals and et cetera. And in the workplace, uh, in my experience, it's the same as true. So whether it's an employee, a frontline supervisor, or even an executive, typically the executive less so, but but even at the executive level, you an OBM practitioner typically comes into the play as a consultant, right, or a coach, or just a subject matter expert, and that's even whether you're an external or an internal uh, OBM practitioner. And I've been both, and I've seen both happen. So you you get into the situation, they really want nothing to do with you. Right. So there's two two things that I think um, has helped in my career uh, establish rapport and um, 
uh, earn, earn the right, if you will, to, to do the work, do the work that we want to do. The first one is making sure that there is a sponsor to the work that you're doing. Um, I found that the best projects and the, this, the projects that had the most success in my experience have been those that had either an executive or a senior manager uh, involved as a sponsor, meaning they were the ones that were, they established the case for why we're doing OBM and why we're doing these, uh, this work. They established the case for why we brought in the OBM practitioner and then they communicated it. So they basically took out the need for us to sell who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it. So it's kind of like a, a, an organizational ambassador. Right, exactly, yeah. So it's an ambassador, a sponsor at the, at the company management level that is leading the change, leading the effort, not necessarily putting the consultant or the OBM practitioner in the, in the rough spot of trying to sell it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't always work, well, right? That was That's my for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, but the parallel would be like in a school. You said you worked in schools. So the parallel that I've seen is when I've worked with principals and the principals wanted to do something in the classroom, for example, like new classroom management techniques. Mm-hmm. So I would have the principal communicated to the teachers so that at a minimum people understand there's an expectation, there's a sponsor at the company level, right, principal or executive, and uh, and we're here to effectively make that happen. So then, okay, now the tough part. So now the communication set, that's part one. And if you don't have part one, it's even harder to do part two. Oh, of course, so yeah. part two is now you're faced with the person that you have to engage with that needs to effectively do the change. So in your world, it'd be the teacher, right? In my world, it'd be the frontline supervisor or the manager. So I, what I typically do is I take a shaping approach. So I start with what's the goal that we're trying to achieve? And then I ask them, where are we at today in your day-to-day? So in your, what's your day in the life? How does that relate to what we're trying to achieve? And where's your starting point? And sometimes the starting point could be a very blank, blank starting point. They've never done what we're trying to do and they have no history about it. And I'll give you an example in a minute. But their starting point is a blank sheet of paper and they don't know how to go from where they are to where the executive wants them to go. So I take a shaping approach and essentially outline a plan across a period of time. Specifically, the time would be based on the goal, right, of the company, and then start shaping them to how to get there. So that's how I take that approach. And that approach um, pretty much has served me well all the time. There's exceptions, of course, but the majority of the time it works. And the reason it works is because I'm not trying to inundate them with too much change all at once. Mm-hmm. So I effectively reinforce them for the shaping steps to get there. So here's a great example. A great example is I was working at a telecommunications company. I was now a consultant. I've been in the field now post-graduate school, maybe five years or so. And this uh, telecommunications company had a department called Accounts Receivable. Probably no different than the clinical ABA agency. It's the company, it's the part of the company where the individuals are collecting the money, are collecting collecting the bill, so to speak. Um, this accounts receivable team was responsible for billions of dollars in receivables. This was a very big company. And so, but they had a very harsh reality that the the what the executives wanted was to reduce the age receivables, meaning the outstanding cash that had not been collected. And it was in the millions. And the, they, what they wanted was these people in this department, which was like a group of about 20 or 30 people, to uh, physically go eyeball to eyeball with the customer and interact with the customer to collect the cash. The starting point was about 50 to 60% of the employees of that population had never actually interacted with the customers at all at a physical level. They relied solely on email communications, mailers, etc. So to ask them to go from where they were to where the executives wanted to go would would have been a huge leap Mm -hmm. because they really fundamentally at what we would have called, they were lacking customer service skills. They really didn't understand what did it mean to interact with a customer in a professional way, maintain the relationship because you don't want to lose the customer, to then effectively close a deal to collect the cash that was outstanding. 
So that's what the starting point was. So my work, the OBM solution that we inter- that we started with, was a huge shaping process where we identified and developed some customer service skills, identified the customers that were outstanding, so used the historical data to help them, and then walked them through some very specific behaviors on how to engage the customer in a professional way, maintain the relationship, and then close the deal. So after about six, seven months, we actually were able to receive more than half of those multi-million dollars that were outstanding. And we did it by a very systematic shaping process. Um, but to answer, go back to your original question, how did we do it? We started with the, where they were, mm-hmm. start where they are, help build the relationship so it's not uber scary, this whole behavior change thing, right. and then shape them along the way with lots of positive reinforcement. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So it, it sounds like you guys probably recouped whatever they spent on the consultation right away, which obviously reinforces the purchasing of those services. Yeah, the actual return on the investment with that one was was a ratio of ten to one. See, that's another example of uh, language differences. You said return <laughs> on investment, which actually is much more clear to ninety nine point nine nine percent of the population. So, uh, yeah, I think I think a parallel, uh, if it, if I if I may, one of the things that I used to do in my clinical practice was um, the insurance companies would allot us so many hours across so many months, and then we would set those targeted goals of the milestones of whatever the skill repertoire we were trying to learn uh, and teach the, the, the kid. So I used to actually have a, a, a data tracker that used to um, the number of billable hours, the time frame, and then the percent of the milestones that we achieved over that time frame. And essentially, from a business context, that's the return on investment. So if I achieved 100% in that time frame, then it was good return on investment. If I cannot achieve that 100% of the milestones, then one could argue that we didn't have a strong return on investment. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not obviously a 100% parallel, right? There's all sorts of variables in that, but that's pretty close. Um, And my boss at the time in the clinical side was very, that's, that's what made um, that's what it made them uh, promote me to become a BCBA supervisor. So I was a BCBA once upon a time, not too long ago actually, mm-hmm. and uh, and I loved that certification, and I did have that supervisory experience. This is just I might age myself a little bit, but this is um, second taskless. Okay. <laughs> for for your audience, so the rules were a little different. Sure. Um, but the but the concept and the service of supervision was the same. Yeah, I took was, I took my BCBA exam on paper and pencil. So that's, I, uh, I I did too. <laughs> yeah, so I, I we aged ourselves a bit, but yeah, and um, but that's what got me promoted was looking at our service, how it relates to the context of the insurance provider's view of our service, and how to effectively demonstrate value, not just to our clients. But our practice and the provider. I see. Um, what are some other things? You know, I'm thinking. Obviously, there's the establishing rapport, talking the same language. With regard to OBM strategies that we could use as in the field clinicians, what are some other strategies as it relates to you know quality assurance and things like leadership and you know sometimes in OBM you. you you hear those types of concepts thrown around and again you put someone like like myself in that and it's like okay well how do you how do you define leadership or how do you define you know uh, quality assurance and, and whatnot so can you help us kind of navigate some of those things and, and if possible maybe this is not too much to ask but uh, you know relate it again back to clinical pra- practice and and the fact that you've done both is is, is makes I perhaps you uniquely qualified to uh, to answer this so with with that ridiculous amount of pressure on your shoulders, <laughs> you know, you know what, do, what do you think about all that? I think it's a great question. I, uh, I guess a couple of, a couple of thoughts come to mind. Um, you know, one of my favorite, um, taglines in terms of introducing the whole concept of why focus on behavior change, uh, in the workplace. And I think there's some parallel to the clinical side is, that my tagline that I love, and I didn't create it, so I, but I don't know who did, is that unfortunately, why do we focus on behavior change in the workplace is because sometimes common sense doesn't necessarily equate to common practice. 
Mm. And a lot of times we're talking about behavior that should ne- should probably be common sense, right? Like effective leadership or safe behavior or productive workforce. And when you say those kind of term- terms, those vague, ambiguous constructs, um, and one could even argue they're behavioral classes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it sounds common sense. And so the OBM practitioner, when they're first introduced to a client, um, similar to, I would say, um, my experience in schools, is you say, well, I'm here as the behavior analyst to work on, so workplace, productive workforce or more productivity, and people should be productive. And then in the school, it would be something like, well, we, want, we just want kids to follow directions. And so the first thing you get faced with is, well, that's just common sense. People should just do what they're supposed to do. Of course. And so I always use the tagline, well, first and foremost, unfortunately, common sense does not equal common practice. Okay, I'm going to steal that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's good. The, the, sec- the other thing I think that relates to what you're talking about is um, on the education side. So a lot of OBM practitioners, including myself, we spend a great deal of time educating uh, individuals in the workplace, whether it's a, a leadership team, a manager, a director, or even a frontline employee, um, to think through their intentions versus their impact. So what I mean by that is a lot of times when we talk about effective leadership or better quality or train your staff to do the right thing, generally speaking, we believe, and I think this is true in behavior analysis anyway, human beings have good intentions. We have good intentions to do the right thing to achieve the right result. So like the parents, I've, I've been inundated with parents in the past where they yell at their kids and they're finger pointing and they're sending them to timeout for like no reason. Mm-hmm. They, but I believe, I fundamentally believe that those parents had great intentions. Oh, sure. They're not, not trying to harm the kids. They, they want to help the kids, but that's what they know. So then I, the first thing I, I do is I educate leaders in the past parents. What was the impact you had don't just focus on your intention. So, for example, I had the unfortunate experience of once seeing a parent stronghold their kid to the wall, basically shove their kid to the wall because they were so emotional, so angry because the kid would not follow directions. Common sense, right? So their intervention was to like force the situation, grab a hold of the kid, put, pin him against the wall to the point where the kid was, so, was physically shuddering, crying, and defecated himself. Oh my. So the impact was not the parent's intention, but in the moment, the, the parent couldn't see it. So my first thought was educate them on the impact first. Like what, did, what happened as a result of what you did and does that line up to your intention? Mm-hmm. Of course the answer is no. Of course the answer is no. Uh, any, any logical human being would say, uh, I don't want that. So then that starts opening up the door to say, okay, let's operationally define, I don't use that terminology in business, but let's define, what do you want? What do you want? drop the operational? I just dropped the operational. Okay. Uh, Define for me, describe to me, what do you want them to do that would then encourage you or, or trigger you to give a lot of positive love and attention? So that's what I would tell the parents. Let me make a parallel to you in the workplace. So I actually once saw a leader grab an employee, oh my. shake the employee and said, you're not listening to me and I'm going to fire you if you don't get this. Oh my gosh. So obviously that leader was beyond emotion, right? Like logic. It was not thinking. But it was strange for me. You know, I saw the parent and then I saw this in the workplace. And workplace bullying and workplace violence is not a new thing. You could Google it, you get a lot of million hits, okay? But in this case, I was coaching the leader and I saw this and so uh, obviously intervened, said, uh, you guys just need to separate because the next thing that would have happened is somebody would have gotten arrested, right? Um, But then I asked the boss, I asked the manager, what was your intention? And his his words were, I just want to get his attention on how important what I'm telling him to do is and he's not getting it. So I said, well, what's your imp- what do you think the impact is of what you just did? And he said exactly what he should have said, which is, I think I'm about to get fired. <laughs> and, and true enough, 
no matter what coaching I could have done, the next day, HR was at his door with a suspension of leave of absence, and he, he never returned to work. So what, what I'm getting at, I guess, is to answer your question is, I, I think beyond just you know describing behavior and defining operationally defining behavior, we really need to understand this intention versus impact because it's a common problem. It's the, to make the parallel of the ABA speak, it's the difference between operationally defining the behavior you want to increase versus the behavior you want to see decrease. Mm-hmm. But more important, you got to have that engagement, that conversation with the parent, the teacher of, so what is your role? What behavior are you going to do to make sure that what you want, you get the impact that you're looking for? Um, so what are the antecedents and consequences that you're going to provide so that when you see that behavior, you're going to provide it? so that your intention of what you're looking for equals the impact that you're going to give. And so I I draw those parallels because that's a huge problem in organizations. People have great intentions, but they don't view the world in terms of the impact that they have on people. And so they end up doing things like bullying in the workplace or using a lot of uh, consequences that lead to negative reinforcements. So a lot of people just avoid the boss because he's a... He or she is a big pain in the you know what, and right. they don't want to deal with it. So I think that's um, that. Those are two things, and I'll add a third just to kind of mix it in. And it's in the world of supervisory skills, leadership skills, and that was the one of the things you talked about is like how do you define leadership? Right. And Aubrey Daniels has a book called Measure of a Leader, and if any of your listeners have never read that book. Uh, by the way, disclaimer, I get no proceeds from this. I'm not, you know, I'm just a big fan. Measure of a Leader by Aubrey Daniels and his brother James Daniels. It's a brilliant book. And what he did was he described leadership, defined leadership, still a bit of a, a construct, but a little better. And it was very simply put, and I'm paraphrasing, the, me- the true measure of a leader, essentially defining leadership, should only be done by looking at the behavior of the people they are leading. So if they're doing the right things, that by definition should be deemed as an effective leader. Mm -hmm. If people are doing the wrong things, that should be by definition deemed as an ineffective leader. And in organizations today, I find that to be a very common problem. That sometimes uh, people are either promoted to leadership because they're the best performers, like a behavior analyst, a really good behavior analyst gets promoted to being a supervisor of other behavior analysts or a manager of a region or a district. But what happens is they're often lacking some of the fundamentals of what does it truly mean to lead people, to manage performance, to manage a budget, to set clear expectations, to provide feedback, you know, all these kind of uh, what we would deem as leadership skills. They, They lack those fundamentals. So a lot of times the OBM practitioner, what we do is first we define what does effective leadership mean in that organization. And a parallel to ABA is if you're working with one one client and the parents have a certain set of values, say, for example, I used to work with a Jewish family. They had a very specific set of values that they were trying to instill in their children. So some behavioral programs just they weren't going to follow. On the other hand, a different family um, has a totally different set of values. So defining uh, what the parents should do to reinforce the behaviors that they want will look totally different. Mm -hmm. The same is true in organizations. Defining leadership in one company versus another company could be totally different. So we take the time to really define what does good leadership mean in this company. Then we make a link. We say, okay. If, you, if that's what good leadership looks like, what are the behaviors you want from your employees that you would then demonstrate these behaviors? It's the equivalent to a parent. You want a parent to reinforce their kid, right? To provide a lot of positive reinforcement, recognition, feedback, et cetera, right? Prompting, you know, et cetera. The parents then need to define what are the behaviors they want the kid to demonstrate to earn those reinforcers. That's the parallel. It's exactly the same thing, except the difference is the behaviors of the leader versus the behavior of the parent is not the leader's intervention 
right? Like the token economy or the reinforcer. It's actually the behavior of the parent, what like giving the praise, giving the reinforcers. So we have to define that first. What are they willing to do as the parent or in the workplace as the leader mm-hmm. to then tie to the performer's behavior or in the clinical side, the kid's behavior? Okay. Well, well um, you're up to the challenge. Thanks. <laughs> well, well, I, it's a great question. And I, I think that's a great article that should be written, actually, because it's, sure. a, it's a fantastic question. Um, let's uh, kind of take this in a somewhat uh, more practical direction. What is a what's a day in the life look like for you know? You, you could take it from your perspective. Of course, you work with other OBM practitioners, uh, and practitioner is probably not the right word, <laughs> but it's probably but it's probably something else that would OB, know, probably... OBM practitioner works. It, okay, it works. all right. Uh, so yeah, what does a day in the life or a week in the life uh, look like? You know, for for those of us who you know are so far removed from that setting. So sure, okay. sure. Um, so uh, a typical, I would say. All right, so I'll give you the first, first of all, I'll give you the consultant's answer, which is it depends. Right. It depends. It depends on... My wife hates it when I answer. I know, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, a great, it's a great tagline for consultants. I think it should be made into a shirt. Um, but the, the truth of the matter is it does depend. So um, I'll give you two, two different weeks okay. that are pretty, pretty typical. So on the first hand, let's say it's a week where there's no projects. No projects, no clients. So an OBM practitioner, in my opinion, this is what I do, is I get very busy on generating leads, so looking for future clients. I do a lot of writing. Uh, typically, dissemination is kind of the, the entry point into getting introduced to clients. Um, a, f- a great example of that is I wrote a blog for... Uh, you had Todd Ward on your podcast. Yep. So I, I wrote a blog for an article for his uh, Behavioral Science of the 21st Century. It actually got uh, the attention on LinkedIn to another blogger that's in the human resource world. They do human resource consulting to businesses. And they wanted to republish that article. And then that led to a discussion with one of their clients to uh, have me come and do some consulting work for them. Wow. So... Typical day in the life is some writing, and the reason for the writing is there's there's a business reason for it is that it could attract a future customer. So, you know, a lot of OBM practitioners like myself, we love to write. Um, it's one of my professional development goals for the next uh, few years is to write, write, write. Uh, but it also has a business um, contingency. The contingency of writing is if you're a good writer and you can attract attention, it might get you some work. Um, so that's, that's pretty typical. So generating leads, making contacts. Um, the best um, early learning that I got in my OBM career was the concept of stakeholdering. So stakeholdering is a concept where you identify people in your world, uh, contacts, people you know well, people you don't know well, uh, uh, p- uh, former clients, current clients, and future potential clients. And you do what's called stakeholdering, which is essentially contacting these folks to not let them forget you and to help drive certain objectives. So, for example, with a current client, you would stakeholder with them in terms of driving the, the work that you're doing, right? Um, so if you were my client and we were working on a project... I would stakeholder with you. I'd contact you on an ongoing basis to make sure whatever work we're doing is going forward, is progressing. Okay. Stakeholdering with past clients is just catching up, right? So I do a lot of catching up. I contact at least one former client a month to find out, hey, what's going on? What's new with you? Hey, have you read this latest article? I just thought of you and et cetera. Stakeholdering is very important in that regards because a past client could be a future client. Sure. And then, of course, with prospective clients, um, one of the things that I like to do is I like to read what they're potentially reading. So look at in their industry or in their field of practice, such as like human resources or maybe even in telecommunications, that industry or human services. I want to know what's going on in their world. And then if I have an opportunity to contact them or get to see them or phone call or whatever, then it becomes... I thought of you when I read this article. Have you read this article? If not, take a read. 
a lot of times it's just networking is what it boils down to. But stakeholdering has a different connotation, and that is that you're trying to meet some objective. Sometimes the objective could be very small. It could be, I just want to get to know you. Another one could be, I want to get work. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a typical day in the life of when there's nothing really going on. And there's no projects, per se. Another one that I find the OBM practitioner does a lot of, uh, including myself, is contacting and networking with other OBM practitioners. So that probably has a parallel in the ABA clinical side. Oh, sure. Um, the Probably one of the uniqueness around OBM is our population, in terms of who deems themselves as OBM practitioners, not very large. Um, right now, uh, so I'm a member of the OBM network, which is a special interest group of the Association for Behavior Analysis International. I've been a member of the group for about 20 years, and um, I find that in the network, we, we network with each other quite frequently, but a lot of us are independent practitioners. We're not part of a big company and, and that kind of thing. So we really require that our network to really help you know work, uh, collaborate. And right. so a lot of times when you don't have a project, uh, you're networking. All right, so that's kind of the typical day in the life. So, so let me just uh, follow up on that. So within that network, I would imagine that if you've got uh, one person in your network who's super busy, they might call you up and say, hey, Manny, I need help with this, you know, can you come to Cincinnati for a couple of days? Or does that does that sort of thing happen? Uh, it it does. It's not frequent. So okay. a lot of times, um, draw a parallel to the broader ABA community. I find it very fascinating. I think we have we have a culture in ABA, if I might use that word, or a consequence history or an expectation. Culture is fine. Uh, culture is fine. <laughs> <For me at least. laughs> we have we have a culture where I think we almost expect that we are giving individuals to one another and almost to the point where we are, we, we're open to freely giving our time and energy to one another. So meaning the phone call to Cincinnati, there are many times where that call will happen, but there's almost an expectation that you're going to come free of charge. Oh, no, that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, it, it is. I, I do believe we have a bit of a culture of that. Um, but that's but that's to say, that's okay. That's not a bad thing. It just means that when we do get that phone call, a lot of times what happens in the field of OBM is our time is 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 precious, and it's also something that we, as a profession, we bill for our time, similar to the ABA clin clinic uh, sure. clinician, right? So it doesn't happen very often, and I think the reason it doesn't happen very often is because the OBM practitioner, just like any other business, um, it, it has a lot of self-interest, right? They're, they're, they have a practice that they're trying to grow and, and all that. That being said, I have had my own set of experiences where it has happened, where we get to collaborate, we get to work on a project together, we uh, support each other in terms of maybe uh, coming together in terms of presenting at conferences together and to a non-ABA community to kind of generate the buzz and, and disseminate OBM. Uh, that happened to me recently, actually. Um, a guy by the name of Dr. Tim Ludwig, who's very uh, prominent in the world of behavioral safety. He's a professor at App State. He brought me to App State to um, this, uh, present at a conference uh, that he was hosting to a non-ABA community, a bunch of safety practitioners and managers and leaders. And my presentation, with, along with his, um, was on behavioral safety. And so he um, graciously, the university paid for my airfare and, and stuff. And um, there was no honorarium. My time wasn't compensated. But at least he brought me there so I didn't have to pay out of my pocket. Sure. And he gave me an opportunity to present to that group. Um, and it was such an awesome experience. You know, it's just one of those things where we got to collaborate on something together. Um, it was a unique opportunity, and we got to do some cool work, and, and it, it really paid off. So, and, and I would imagine that in the long term, you know, you, maybe you haven't realized those returns yet, but it wouldn't surprise me if the time was well spent uh, and made up with perhaps business, you know, uh, oh, yeah. business interest down the road. Absolutely. It generated some leads for both of us. I actually... Um, one of my leads wanted something that I thought Tim was better suited for, so I sent them to Tim. Mm -hmm. 
with with no expectation of referral fee or anything. It's just the right thing to do. Just Tim, this is your band camp, not mine. So you do that, and 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 he's he sent some people my way. So it's it's such a nice uh, respected collaboration, and I wouldn't say that's the norm. I would say that's more the rarity, but but it happens, and it's it's really cool when it happens. Okay, we're, we're getting a little OBM confidential here, so uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're gonna go pretty I, deep. Uh, I would like to answer your question in terms of the day in the life of the project side. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, because that's kind of a unique thing, I think. Well, and, the reason uh, why I asked that question is is I remember because uh, we we haven't talked about this when we were setting up this interview, but I briefly considered a, a, an OBM direction myself. Oh, cool! And. Uh, when I, I went to Auburn University, as many of the listeners know, and uh, took behavioral safety courses from Bill Hopkins. Oh, and, my 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 pal, man. Oh, he's yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a gem. Um, anyway, we went to a conference, and I think it was the Florida Association for Behavior Analysis conference, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is way way back in the day, but anyway. Uh, he, there was probably about uh, maybe a half dozen of us graduate students, and he got a the CEO of uh, a large behavioral consulting company that I'll probably not name, uh, and we were talking about that sort of thing, and, and the, the level of travel that was involved and, and all that sort of thing was, was, was overwhelming. And, and, and this person was saying that they actually had two wardrobes, one wardrobe that was continuously packed and one wardrobe that was just left, you know, in the closet and, and, and dresser and things like that. And it was, for, for me, it was like, hmm, that caused me to kind yeah. of reconsider a little bit. I, you know, oh, yeah. So uh, is, is it as bad as it was portrayed, you know, and this is literally 20 years ago, probably a little bit longer than that. Um, or, or are you able to, you know, can an OBM practitioner, uh, I guess it depends on where they're located, certainly. But, you know, what, what, what are the, tra- you know, travel, you know, home work life balance? We hear a lot about that these days. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a that's a man. That's. We could do a whole podcast just on that. So I'll, well, I'll try to be concise, but I, I well, think the quick answer to your question is yes, it, it definitely can be that way. Um, so I, I had the great fortune um, to work with two consulting firms uh, in the OBM space. Um, I, won't, I won't name drop, but, <laughs> but two very prominent um, uh, OBM consulting companies. And the... The busy OBM practitioner could get very busy. So I've had projects, for example, where the day in the life was uh, Monday morning, waking up with my suitcase, uh, going to the airport for that 8, 9 a.m. flight, go right to the client site. Sometimes could be a two-hour flight, sometimes could be a six-hour flight. But the moment you land, you go right to the client site, you get started working for at least a few hours, and then you go to the hotel, and you're there Monday through Friday, and you leave Friday afternoon, go back home, all to do laundry, pack the suitcase Sunday, and then go right back Monday. So it's it is a thing, right? I remember one project in particular. I knew I knew the business owner of two different laundry mats. I knew their open and close times. Mm-hmm. I knew I knew their prices by heart. They knew my name by heart. I also knew uh, four different owners of different restaurants because I went there frequently. And and then the hotel would hold my luggage for me after I did my laundry on Thursday. They'd hold my long, my luggage on Friday just so I didn't have to lug it come back next Monday. So it is it is a thing. It is a, it is a reality. The other reality, too, is it goes back to my, my key phrase, it depends. Sure. So in my current practice, in my current work of OBM uh, consulting and practice, I do very little traveling. I have established... Um, I have established my work now, after after years of traveling and doing that grind, um, where I do a lot of virtual coaching. I do a lot of virtual consultation. Um, I set up projects now where I meet with the clients maybe once a month for a couple of days or maybe even a few times every six months. But we then pair it with um, uh, consulting virtually as well. Um, so that, that is also a reality where the OBM practitioner could do a great deal of work from a virtual platform 
and not travel very much. And uh, we were talking about our kids before the interview. I mean, for somebody that re that needs work-life balance, like myself, with kids, with a family, um, I think it's absolutely essential that if you need a certain level of work-life balance, meaning, and we can define that, right? If you need to be home certain uh, days, you know, times of the year and hours and all that, then you can make it work. The challenge becomes the job front, meaning there's not uh, the OBM professional gets jobs in basically two or three different ways, and and that dictates kind of the opportunity for work-life balance. So you could be an external consultant doing that, doing that uh, air, airplane hopping. Uh, sure. Thing. The road and warrior. It, the road warrior, and I did that. I did that for many years, and it's a great career. It's an awesome career. It's very lucrative financially, and it's also very rewarding in terms of the types of projects you do and all that. Um, but it's a it's a grind, you know. It's a grind, and it is true what they say. You know, consultants can make it work, right? You can do the grind and make it work and have a very nice, you know, family life because you are. Um, supporting your family financially speaking very well but you sacrifice a lot so you I know I knew consultants that had kids that missed lots of birthdays lots of holidays you know lots of dance recitals and school plays and baseball games and you name it so that's a reality but I've also met consultants that made it work now when I was doing it I had no kids my wife was also a consultant so that helped and we would see each other on the weekends. We made the most of our weekends, and then we're back on the road. So shift a little bit. My second career move, I worked inside a company. So that's the second job type of an OBM practitioner, where you work inside a company. And when you work inside a company, you then fall into the realm of that company's culture. So I had a job where my company, I had to travel, but they actually were insistent because of budget constraints for the people inside the company, like myself, not to travel more than once a month and never to travel more than three to four days a month, unless you had to travel international, but that was an exception, not the rule. The other thing is that they were very respectful of holidays and weekends. In fact, they insisted that you take vacation days and holidays because it was the old, it's the adage of if you don't use it, you lose it, mm -hmm. right? So they were very insistent where in the external consulting game, that's not a thing. You know, you, if you want to take vacation for a month, you build it into your project plan. You, ex, you put the expectation with the client that they understand, I'm going to take off for a month or if you take off for a week or whatever. So you, even if you're a full-time employee, you have vacation days, it's not as managed as you are internally. Mm -hmm. So the second type of job lends itself a little bit more to that work-life balance from a organization system kind of perspective. The third type of job is now kind of the job that I'm in right now. So the job that I'm in right now is I have a consulting practice, but I'm essentially managing it myself. So the equivalent is the ABA practitioner who's an independent contractor and takes the cases they want to take and not take, do the number of hours they want to do. And so the ABA independent contractor has a better work-life balance, I think, because they're accepting the work that they want to take. So meaning they're taking on the burden of the number of hours they want to work. And not. Sure. The same thing is true with what I'm doing. I've turned down work because it would have required me to do so many hours, so much travel that I just, I'm at a point in my career where I'm just choosing not to do it. Um, I'm also at a point where the projects that we are working on, like I said before, I'm able to design it so I can do a lot of it virtually. So I think that's the third type of like career for the OBM practitioner is the independent kind of entrepreneurial kind of work and they're basically managing their own work life balance. So they take kind of everything by them by their own hands. And so I think there's no real secret or there's no real I don't believe that there is like a cookie cutter approach to better work life balance in the field of OBM and maybe even in the field of ABA. I think it's more about what job you have and what you're willing to accept to lead you to result in the work-life balance you want. 
I just end with this and kind of for your audience in particular. So I was, when I was an ABA clinician, I was doing the grind a little bit similar to an OBM consultant, but it wasn't on a plane. It was in my car. Oh yeah. And, and yeah, there you go. And that, that, that's why I created this podcast, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Right. To get out of the car. And um, yeah, so I was in my car. Sometimes I was in my car two to three hours a day. I was doing in school service, but I was also doing in home service. And I mean, I probably clocked more miles in my car in a month than, than some people do in a year. And, and th- maybe that's an exaggeration, but it doesn't feel that way. No, and, there's, there's a lot of people listening to this right now who are nodding their heads in unison. So <laughs> Yeah, and, and at the time, you know, I was a graduate student, and then I did that for another year and a half after grad school. And I found that my work-life balance was off. I mean, I felt a little bit like I was accepting this job, this way to do this job. I accepted it. But if I, now thinking back, if I were to do it again, I would do it very differently. You know, I applaud, I've met a lot of ABA clinical practitioners that they take cases in in a certain radius from where they live. I applaud that. I think that's a smart move. I didn't do that. I mean, I was going way, way away from my home. Mm -hmm. Um, I also applaud, this wasn't so big when I was a a BCBA or behavior analyst. There wasn't so many clinics, you know, there's now there's the clinic ABA therapy provider. Man, what a cool gig. You go to a place, one place, the clients come to you. Oh, I know. I mean, that's, that's a cool gig. I didn't have that. So I don't, I didn't experience that. But, uh, I bet that probably lends itself a little bit more to work-life balance. So I think, bottom line, I think the crux of my point is it all depends on the job you're willing to accept, understanding the expectations of that job and how that translates to the work-life balance you want. I see. Yeah. Uh, good Good. Good points. Um, I'm looking at the clock right now, and I know you've got to skedaddle here. So let's do this. There's... We didn't even get to half the things I wanted to ask you about. Well, I have some more time if, if you want it. All right. So let's I, close I with... I could another half an hour if you want. All right. Let's close with this then. Um, and, and then we'll maybe tee up a, 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 a Manny part two. Um, so... That excites me. You have no idea. I'm very happy about that. They, all right, all I'm right. so flattered you said that. <laughs> well, this is good stuff. And I think it's applicable um, to the, the everyday practitioner. So... I, I guess what I'm curious about is it, it kind of sounds like you're describing there, there's different types of, you know, shall we say kind of portfolio career tracks, right? And I'm wondering if that's the direction that you think perhaps OBM is going in. Because one of the things I'm just curious to, to know is where do you think the field is going, you know, in the ne- in the, in a, like a two to five year, give or take, her- time horizon? That's a that's a fantastic question. So uh, I, I'll preface this with I I feel very humbled and honored that I've been part of the OBM network for so many years, and also I'm I'm at a I've um, I've been honored to play a role now um, on my second year in the uh, OBM network um, board of directors. So I'm the current president of the network. And I, I only say that because to answer your question, I think it requires a certain level of understanding of the field at a broad level and a historical level. And I've just been so fortunate to have that. So I hope I do it justice to the OVM field answering your question. So that's well, if you got a bunch of hate mail, you can fix it in the <laughs> follow-up interview. So. Uh, 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 I'll send them to you too. <laughs> all right, all right. So, yeah, CC me on it, please. So I think um, two. Th- I think a few things. So in the next two to five years, I think um, OBM as a field is going to get a great deal of recognition. It's going to get more disseminated um, in in a few industries. The first industry is human services. So in the last couple of years, I have found. I've been inundated with all sorts of great emails and requests for uh, students and practitioners in the clinical ABA side, human service side, asking about OBM and 
asking some of the, some of the same questions you've asked me today. And, and I love that, I, but it surprised me. Some of the questions were about what is OBM and how does one get into the field? And, you know, those some of the same questions you've asked me. So I think in the next two to five years, we're going to see a very uh, increase in OBM practitioners in human service settings. And just to be very transparent, ethical about what I'm saying, I feel like I have to say I'm in a position right now, some of your listeners may know this, where I am actually uh, educating through uh, my company, through the company I work for and our affiliation with a university with Florida Tech, uh, we're disseminating educating in OBM to to practitioners out there, so people not in non students, right? People out there doing work. So this is through the continuing ed. This is uh, continuing ed program at Florida Tech. Yeah. So I have helped develop a, um, an OBM program called our OBM certificate, and the whole point was because of a demand, a request from ABA practitioners, ABA clinical practitioners, to learn about this. So my hope is that I won't be the only one doing it. So my hope is that in the next two to five years, because I, I don't mind competition, I like competition. So next two to five years, I want to see a wave of uh, more continuing education in OBM for the ABA practitioners in particular to advance OBM practitioners, more OBM practitioners in the human service side. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I think anyone listening to this, I mean, there's a lot of really well-run uh, human service agencies out there, but just to be candid here, you know, there's, there's, I've heard you know a lot of horror stories as well about how some of these places are, are managed, and it probably goes back to what you were saying earlier about you know being a good clinician may not necessarily translate into being a good uh, you know leader. However, we may choose to define that you know, and if we're defining it by the systems in, that are in place and the and the and the workplace uh, out, uh, outcomes, etc. Right. You know, th- those two things aren't directly trans- transferable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I would say the same is true for the business owner of an ABA clinic. I think it's been very, I think it's been awesome, the growth in autism with ABA. I, I respect so much those people, in particular the people that have gone to the point where they've established their own companies mm-hmm. and they've grown those companies and now have employees and all that kind of stuff. But what I've uh, come to appreciate, and I'm I'm working with a few folks um, that own companies. Their first kind of opening confession, if you will, is that they wanted to start a company, but they really had no idea what it meant to run a company and how to start a company. And not a lot of OBM practitioners, by the way, know how to run a company. That's a misnomer. OBM does not necessarily equate to MBA, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> but um, but those of us who have um, started our own companies, I used to have my own small business, I used to have my own S corporation, um, and have worked in companies that are well run as a company, so learning more business acumen, business 101, it really helps, it really does, So, and it's not ABA 101, it's not OBM 101, it's, it's, it's business 101. That's right. So I, I find it very heartwarming and yet interesting that the same dichotomy of going from effective behavior analyst to struggling supervisor is also true to in the sense of effective behavior analyst to uh, worried, frustrated, scared entrepreneur, you know, business mm-hmm. owner. But I think I think going back to your original question, the next two to five years, I anticipate a huge continued growth of more ABA clinic, uh, clinical companies, more young, more vigorous, interested entrepreneurs starting their own pra- practices. I also see, uh, and that leads to a need for making sure that people know the business side of behavior analysis, knowing OBM and how to integrate it all into their business, into their leadership skills, into their management philosophies. So I definitely see a, an increase in the next two to five years in you, terms of OBM and human services. Manny, one of the things that uh, I saw the other day was a tweet, and I can't remember who it was from, but uh, they were quoting the Behavior Analysis Certification Board, and they were saying something like, there is going to be a 
and this is a direct quote, a tsunami of certificates, you know, in, in the next, you know, uh, decade or so. And mm-hmm. uh, so it, it, I, I think your, your, your point's well taken. You know, there's going to be a lot of opportunities and, and conversely need. I guess those are two sides of the same coin, one, one could argue. Of, of kind of a, a business to business or you know type of of service or need that that would that's going to be out there for sure yeah and I, I think one of the, the that word tsunami I'm sure was used purposefully because where do tsunamis happen they happen in other parts of the country and other parts of the world sorry like Asia mm-hmm. and I've had um, I've had the opportunity to work internationally including in China and uh, and India and other parts of Asia and there is a huge demand for not just OBM uh, because that's what I was doing of course but uh, for ABA clinical practitioners overseas and and I think the the board the behavior analysis certification board they've seen an increase in certificates from other parts of the world not just Asia but other parts of the world and so that that quote is very fascinating because I totally agree with it mm-hmm. and I would say they might have used that word meaningfully because in the other parts of the world beyond the US there's a huge need huge demand and I'm seeing an increase of OBM practitioners uh, becoming members of the OBM network outside of the US and and they're small in numbers now but that's how everything starts everything starts in small numbers sure. and then it just it goes crazy I actually have, um, as part of our um, uh, OBM certificate, I got in touch with some, um, somebody in Australia. And she's a brilliant lady. She's been doing behavioral safety work for years. But she's not in the U.S. and she wasn't you know, connected uh, as she wanted to be. So she contacted me. And now she's one of the instructors on the certificate program. Oh, nice. And I'm so excited for her. And I'm more excited if she gets US based students, they're gonna learn from somebody in a different country with a different perspective and a different culture and different, it's just gonna be awesome. So I think the next two to five years, one of the other things I wanted to mention that I think is gonna happen is we're gonna see not just a growth in human services, but we're also gonna see a growth in OBM practitioners. And I would say they're gonna come from two buckets. They're gonna come from the human service side, not just ABA, but also healthcare, and they're going to come from um, residential facilities, so they're going to they're going to come from that space, and then also internationally. So that's I think that's going to happen. the The other thing I think that's going to happen that I hope I'm part of is broader dissemination of OBM, and that's probably that goes without saying. It's something that we talk about in behavior analysis a lot, right? Is the dissemination to the mainstream. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite. Uh, one of my favorite um, behavior analysts that writes about dissemination is Dr. Patrick Fryman. Oh yeah, yeah, and um, and I've heard him speak, and I've I've watched his work. Over yeah, I, he's a he's a he's a national treasure. Yeah, <laughs> I've interviewed him a couple of times, met him in person a couple of times. Oh, cool. Yeah, he's, he's neat, great neat guy. Yeah, yeah, cool guy. And I've never met him, and I I hope to one day. But I'm, I I've read his stuff, and one of the things that he talked about was, of course, um, dissemination of ABA was Skinner's Skinner's mission, right? Skinner's vision of this. And I would say in the field of OBM, we have a ways to go. We have some pioneers in the field that have done it, like Aubrey Daniels, you know, has written a great deal of work, literature. Uh, there's there's multitude of others, like uh, Dr. Leslie Wilk Brax, it's one. Um, uh, Dr. Bill Abernathy is another one. I hope to be one of those people, you know, writing writing literature, disseminating OBM in the mainstream. And I see that happening in the next two to five years, not just I'm going to push myself to do it, but also I, I want, I, I, I foresee other OBM practitioners doing the same. So that's the third thing I see in the field of OBM happening um, is, is growth in terms of dissemination. Cool, cool. Now, uh, so what, what I want to do is uh, talk about, you've got a book that you're working on, right? Yeah, it's, uh, and I feel very humble and embarrassed to plug it. So I'll go ahead. Yeah, I, well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. Why don't you give us the title and what and, and like the uh, 
what are they called? The jacket, that, that, the, the, jack, the liner yeah. notes, or whatever sure. you want to call it. Uh, sure, sure. And, and, the, and then when it's ready to go, uh, I would love for you to come back on. We can talk about it in more detail, and you can you, okay. can, you can shamelessly plug it. Uh, All right, so, fair enough, fair so, enough. So tell tell us tell us what it's called, and uh, tell Sounds us what good. it's about. So I'll I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, please if, for your audience' sake. Anyway, you probably are going to hear out of my voice a smile and a and. I just want visualization of a look of embarrassment right now because I'm going to, but anyway, so just to get past that. So the, the book is called OBM applied and, uh, I, um, I have two co-authors, uh, Dr. Daniel Sunberg and, uh, Shannon Biagi, um, Dr. Dan, both of whom work for the company. I work for ABA technologies, OBM applied the jacket version is a handbook. And it's a handbook for practitioners that fundamentally want to implement OBM projects, a uh, project that is intended to meet that definition that I gave earlier, which is applying the science of behavior in the workplace to make a positive difference in people's lives. And I wish I was reading from a script, but I'm kind of fluent at this. so I'm I, sure you've re- uh, re-read and rewritten <laughs> everything a hundred times. I, I, right? A thousand times. It's been a year in the making, to be honest. Um, it's actually... So the book, the content of the book, is also the very content uh, that we use in the OBM certificate at Florida Tech. So it's one, it's, but we wrote the book in a way that you don't actually need to take the certificate program. We wanted it to be a standalone book so that if you were a practitioner that felt confident, that, that fundamentally believed you could do it, but you just wanted a a roadmap. You wanted some guidelines. You wanted some guidance on how to implement OBM. That's what the book's intended for. The other thing too is um, the behavior analyst reader, they're gonna learn some new terminology because I couldn't help myself when I'm writing the book with my co-authors. I come from a business background and a consulting background. So a lot of the literature and a lot of the language in there is truly OBM friendly, but it may not be technically clinically ABA friendly. So things like stakeholdering mm-hmm. and what a stakeholder is and something called a business opportunity. You know, So those kind of things are part of the book beca- for a reason. And the reason is that the audience is intended to be any practitioner in any profession, whether it's ABA or a HR professional or a process engineer or you know what have you the goal is to any practitioner any professional that just wants to make a difference and implement some significant change to achieve a business outcome um, using a science-based evidence-based approach so that's what the book's intended to be is a, a guideline a roadmap a set of tools and techniques all based on the wonderful work of pioneers like Aubrey Daniels and others that have been uh, doing OBM a lot longer than I have. Uh, and what we did to make sure that happened was we, we went back to the research. So we went back to the early days of, of the Journal of Organizational Behavior Management published in the 19, late 70s. And we even went back further than that. And then we went all the way to the present day, 21st century. And we pulled from all sorts of awesome OBM resources and created this book. Cool. Wow. I'm really, I'm really fortunate. I had two great team members to help write it. I had the support and love of my colleagues in our company, and I had, I had great input and, and support from people in the OBM network. So it's, it's coming out soon. It's, uh, I'm really excited about it. Also, of course, very anxious because it's my first book, uh, and I'm happy that I have co-authors as well. It's all actually, it's all three of our first books. And um, yeah, it's it's coming soon. It's it's going to be great. I'm excited about it. Oh, that's uh, that's very exciting. So, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, when you know it's coming out, uh, give me a holler. We'll have you back on, and maybe we awesome. can do some you know kind of four way Skype or something like that, and get the whole, was, the whole crew in. And- I was hoping you would say that they would be on cloud nine. If I don't, if you don't mind, I'll just if they're listening, I just want to say a special thanks to them. Dr. Dan Sunberg is a, uh, a, I like to call it a newly minted PhD. He just 
He graduated recently from Western Michigan University. He's such a bright guy, super smart, and just so great. Um, and uh, Shannon Biagi is a current PhD student at Florida Tech. Uh, both are employees of ABA Tech. They're both brilliant. Of course, I'm I'm obviously biased, but I just they're I'm crazy about those two. So um, I I think they would be on cloud nine to uh, to okay, do it. Great. Well, we'll we'll definitely do it then. Uh, Manny Rodriguez, thanks so much for spending. <laughs> probably way more time than we intended but it's it, was, uh, it was fun uh so we'll we'll look forward to a uh, another conversation with you thank you matt really appreciate the time yeah, my pleasure take care hey folks i hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as i did you know this has been by far the longest interview that i've conducted and to be perfectly candid with you it could have gone on even longer Manny and I talked about a lot more both before and after the actual interview and what I got out of that is basically I could probably have him on a couple of more times and still cover novel territory so again I hope you enjoyed learning about organizational behavior management in a uh, very personal way in the in a, only the way that Manny can deliver and uh, if you can want to know more about uh, Manny or ABA Technologies, head on over to abatechnologies.com. And for those of you who are in need of continuing ed uh, credits, they do offer those there in conjunction with Florida Tech. So thanks again, Manny, for coming on the show and look forward to talking with you in the future. Um, also, be sure to check out our sponsor, bside21.org. There's lots of stuff that both Manny and his co-authors have uh, written there. That's uh, you know fun articles to read. And then finally, if you get a chance, if you enjoyed this podcast episode and you haven't done so already, please uh, head on over to iTunes and uh, write up a rating and review. That would be awesome. And until the next time, uh, thanks for checking out this session of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.